Great, thank you, Jeremy, and uh, to the organisers for inviting me. It's great to be in Boston, uh, in the shadow of MIT and Genentech and Microsoft, as we've already heard. And also with Cambridge Brewing Company, which is maybe not quite on the same level, but uh, worth a trip. I'm grateful to have the opportunity to, to talk to you about, um, about this project, which is in very early stages at the moment. Um, we've been working on it for about nine months. It's formed the, the vast majority of my work during this first year of my PhD. And um, so the data I'm going to be presenting is quite preliminary, uh, but um, I hope, I'm hoping to convey some of the reasons that we're interested in this approach and some of the, some of the, um, the ways in which it's applicable uh, in, in various studies, um, particularly to immunogenicity. Um, we've already heard a bit about the Avarice Consortium uh, from Professor Diesenhammer, but um, I'm going to briefly outline um, the structure of the consortium again and um, outline UCL's role within it. Talk about our new screening approach, um, which is uh, basically we think it's going to be a counterpart to gene array technology, but a phenotypic equivalent. I'm going to briefly discuss some of the experiments we've been doing to validate the technique um, in our hands, and then I'm going to talk about the rationale studying BREGs. Um, I'm lucky enough to study with Claudia Maori, and she's uh, interested in the basic biology of uh, B cells. And uh, we think that there's uh, a solid logic behind studying uh, these regulatory B cells in the context of immunogenicity, and some of the early results we've got from the, uh, from the preliminary experiments. <coughs> so, Avirisk uh, is an EU wide consortium. Um, made up of several research institutions and uh, pharmaceutical companies, uh, which is um, focused on elucidating the contribution of various factors uh, to the problem of immunogenicity. Uh, we've heard a bit about uh, the drug factors and the manufacturing processes and the, and the way that can influence um, uh, the risk of, of, of anti-drug antibodies. Uh, but UCL's approach um, is mainly involved in the correlation between patient or clinical factors and the incidence of immunogenicity. So we're, we're hoping in the long term to develop a clinical tool which will able, enable us to, um, to use these early activation markers, CD markers, uh, to predict which patients will respond most, pr most favorably to um, particular uh, biopharmaceuticals. Being a B cell lab, we're also, um, it's too tempting not to look at the, uh, the, the phenotypic and functional capacity of, the, of these B cells, both in healthy controls that we're looking at and um, principally in RA to begin with. We're also looking at multiple sclerosis and hopefully moving into uh, haemophilia as well, in fact, rate intolerance. Um, so as we go along, collecting this data for Avarisk, we're also looking at, uh, we're mining the data at the same time for. Um, markers that better define the regulatory subset of B cells, and I'm going to talk about that in the second half of the talk a bit more. So we've been working closely with a company called Bio, BioLegend, um, based in the US, and they've uh, developed this new platform, which is a high-throughput screening platform for cell surface markers. And um, it's essentially four 96 well plates. Every well contains a, a fluorochrome conjugated antibody to a particular CD marker, 332 in total, plus the relevant controls. And we take uh, blood samples from patients and healthy controls, I say uh, at least 40 million PBMCs from each, from each person. We plate out 100,000 PBMCs in every well, which um, make some stain up for one of these particular CD markers. We then apply an overstain, which is um, an antibody panel, uh, with subset markers of, of interest, allowing us to distinguish the various subsets of the cells we're interested in. And this is where the uh, applicability of this technique comes in. This panel can be anything you want, anything you're interested in. Uh, so we're focusing on the B cells. We're also moving into PDCs. And we've, we're going to shortly start on um, uh, analyzing greater depth CD4 T cell subsets. And we perceived a high, flu high throughput flow cytometry. So effectively, we end up um, with the ability to measure the expression of 332 cell surface markers in parallel on various subsets of interest. So the first question we wanted to ask was whether or not there's sufficient reproducibility in the human, uh, healthy human um, cohort that we can generate a baseline against which to compare people with rheumatoid arthritis and eventually to compare 
the, rheumatoid, the rheumatoid arthritis uh, cohort within itself, those who, who will eventually go on to generate antidrug antibodies and, and those who don't. So in order to find out whether, whether or not there's sufficient reproducibility, we started off with five healthy controls. Can you see that? Can you see the colors? Just about. Uh, so these are heat maps from five of the, the, of the first healthy controls we did, and the, um, each square represents the cell surface market expression of one particular CD antigen. <laughs> So red is extremely highly expressed, a high MFI, and black, uh, uh, no expression at all. And I think you'll agree that there is a startling degree of conformity between the healthy controls. It surprised us to find this, this degree of reproducibility, but, but, but there's a result. It's worth mentioning that the resolution of these heat, map, heat maps is quite low at this stage. We're looking at whole PBMCs, and therefore the range of MFIs is, is very large. And if you were to take out some of these uh, markers that aren't expressed at all, you begin to see slight variation in, in the in the MFI on, on, on this on this style of heat map. Nevertheless, um, the, it, the CV values aren't great, and it, we, we believe this to be um, uh, a useful enough technique that we can now produce a, a healthy baseline immune signature, a profile which is normal. So, two questions came up immediately. Um, first is, is what we're seeing real? I mean, are these expression levels uh, what we would expect on the markers which have a, a long history in the literature? Because if we can't um, reproduce the expected profile, uh, then we can't then use it as a shotgun screen to find novel markers. And secondly, if we can't resolve any differences between the healthy controls, is the technique at all powerful enough to resolve any differences whatsoever? So to answer the first question, we honed in on the uh, B cells, looking um, at the CD19 gate with our um, subset panel. And we see the B cell specific markers, uh, the ones we would expect to be expressed in this gate, are all expressed, and in the, uh, you know, with, the, with the profiles and the patterns that we would, express, uh, we would expect from the whole CD19 gate. And T cell specific markers uh, are not expressed. So we're, we're, we're gaining confidence that these, um, these this screen is able to produce uh, valid and robust results. We can do the al alternative, of course, look at CD4 gate, and we get markers uh, which we would expect to be expressed on CD4 T cells and uh, nothing in the B cell gates. And these lists go on and on. I'm just showing you the four most obvious ones. So that gave us confidence. We've got a reproducible technique. We, uh, the results we believe are genuine. So is it? Is it powerful enough a technique to resolve any differences at all? The second question I mentioned. So we took five patients with active rheumatoid arthritis, and these patients aren't being treated with biological drugs at the moment. These are all um, being treated with some combination of um, standard conventional disease-modifying drugs, hydroxychloroquine, sulfasalazine, that sort of thing. They all have very similar disease activity scores, the standard uh, DAS score that we use in the NHS quite regularly. And another um, way of measuring the disease activity is by looking at the circulating levels of C-reactive protein, and all but one of these patients have uh, very similar and high levels of C-reactive protein. And we can compare um, the immunological profiles from these patients with sex and age-matched healthy controls. So this is again looking at MFI, but this time fold change from a, a mean healthy baseline. We um, took a mean from the healthy controls. So we, we believe that that's um, uh, a justified approach, considering the the, uh, the, the the level of reproducibility. And we can see two things of importance here. First of all, there are differences to be found, which is great news for us, between the RA cohort and the healthy control group. But more importantly, in the context of immunogenicity, that there are differences between the uh, individual arthritis patients within within this cohort, there are differences to be found, and this is in, in, important because if we want to try and develop this technique as a way of looking at um, predictive markers for those who are going to develop ideas and those who aren't, we need to see differences in the in the rheumatoid arthritis cohort, and we can. In fact, <coughs> this RA4 patient is the one with a low CRP, and it's interesting, although only n equals one. Interesting to see that we see differences in this patient between the other three. And RA3, looking back through the clinical data, had, had a flare the week before the, uh, the blood sample was taken. So we, we already knew, really, that the RA cohort was a, 
heterogeneous group of people. You know, it's not used, it's generally considered a syndrome rather than a, than a disease with a, with a defined pathogenesis. But um, great news for us that we can we can find these differences um, both between the RA and the healthy cohort and within the RA cohort itself. It's another another way of expressing some of these data. We we get a quite high degree of uh, change in um, this is looking at CD4 cells. Sorry high degree of change, both up and down regulated. The ones that are down regulated tend to be things you'd expect, uh, act, uh, activation mar uh, markers that um, usually expressed on naive cells. The ones that are up regulated in RA are very often um, uh, chemokine receptors, um, integrins, and things like that. So we believe we've got a platform which is robust enough and reliable enough to um, to apply in the, in the context of immunogenicity. But along the way, we're interested in looking at um, B cells, in particular a subset of B cells known to have regulatory capacity. And although these cells are well documented, the, there are very few um, uh, markers which clearly identify them as apart from other B cell subsets. So at the same time as collecting this data, we're mining it for um, potential markers that better define this regulatory subset of B cells and also we can look at the functional capacity of B cells um, in RA versus healthy controls. So I'm going to give you a bit of background in B cell subsets. Um, this is the framework by which um, we separate our B cells. It's um, a framework uh, first described by Rita Carsetti. We and many other groups use this. Um, these uh, double expressing cells co-expressing CD24 and CD38 are immature. They're represented here in the foremost histograms. You see they're both IgM and IgD high. CD27, which is a marker of uh, memory uh, B cells, they're low in that. Interestingly, also high in CD5 and CD1D. That's, that's another story. Mature cells are intermediate for both markers, and the memory cells are high for 24, this is the CD38 negative. So, the rationale behind studying uh, regulatory B cells in this context is um, that since there's a pleiotropic role of B cells, we know that in um, several autoimmune diseases they're mediated by antibodies. Uh, like rheumatoid arthritis is a prime example, systemic lupus or erythematosus is another. Um, we think that since the regulatory B cells might be, uh, the, these are the immature B cells, might be implicated in the resolution of such diseases, they might be important also. Um, in the uh, decision between uh, the generation of anti-drug antibodies or not. If we culture our three subsets of B cells with a CD40 ligand expressing uh, cell line, we see that the vast majority, the lion's share of the IL-10 is produced by these B cells uh, in the immature gate, the CD24 high, CD38 high gate. And we've already heard today that pretty much all uh, cell types can be induced to produce IL-10, but um, there's a significant increase, uh, a significant enrichment in this immature uh, B cell population. Furthermore, um, in co-culture <coughs> experiments with activated T cells, we can see that uh, neither the, the memory nor mature subsets of B cells are able to suppress the uh, production of interferon gamma or TNF-alpha as, me as measured intracellularly. Uh, whereas if we co-culture this immature subset of B cells, we get a, uh, su a suppression of T helper cell differentiation, um, yeah, lower levels of interferon gamma and TNF alpha. Furthermore, if you then isolate the T cells from these cultures, they're enriched in FOXB3 expressing cells, and the, t the CD4 T cells themselves express more IL-10. Mm -hmm. So that's the rationale behind studying these, this, this particular subset of B cells. We think that it might be important in the decision between tolerance and immunity in general, um, particularly in, uh, in antibody-mediated autoimmune diseases. And we think that there may be some uh, um, uh, reason for looking at this subset in the, in the uh, context of immunogenicity. So we mined the data for um, differences between these three subsets here, mature, immature in the middle, and memory on the end. Again, we're just showing MFI here. This time, yellow is high expression, black is low expression. And uh, before I mention these two markers, there's, um, it's worth noting there are some internal controls here. 
IgD and IgM uh, are expressed in the, in the profile we would expect, CD27 down here, the memory cell marker, also highly expressed on memory cells and not in the other two gates. And you can see that once we start zooming in on particular subsets of cells, you start to get greater variation between these five healthy controls, these five healthy uh, individuals in, in the columns here. But the CV values are very low, and uh, we, we're, we're quite happy with this level of variation uh, you know, in terms of producing a, a, a baseline. So the controls and the reproducibility give us a confidence that what we're seeing here in an, in, uh, when we get positive hits in novel markers that we haven't previously uh, thought about, that this is a real result and it's worth following up. So here we can see CD9 is most highly expressed on immature B cells. And we think this might be um, possibly a, 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 an important marker of regulatory B cells. Um, it's, it's a hypothesis that we're following up currently. You can't quite see it in, in here, but it's also most highly ex CD81 is also most highly expressed on immature B cells. And these two uh, markers are thought to interact. Um, just from the literature, they're known um, to have uh, uh, some, some sort of interaction. It's thought they may have a synergistic role. And this is um, validated again, confirmed by normal off the shelf antibodies. Here in red is the immature cells, the most highly, ex uh, most highly expressing CD9, CD81. These differences here are highly, highly uh, significant. Both have a p value of less than 0.001. And so this is just an example, really, of the, um, the ability of this approach to generate hypotheses. So it's not only a, a hypothesis generating tool, but we're hoping also it will be a clinical tool in the future to, to, to um, uh, predict which patients will, will, be able, will respond badly to a particular drug. We can also mine this data for differences between <coughs> healthy and RA to look at the pathogenesis of the disease. So there's, there's three things that we can look at. Immunogenicity, hopefully in the long term, the better definition of Bregs, and also uh, the pathogenesis of RA. And you know, to our delight, when we look at this, it sort of vindicates our, our interest in immature B cells. There are more differences here than in any other subset. They're quite marked. Um, we see, uh, again, some of these differences are consistent across the RA cohort, suggesting there might be interesting leads to follow up in the pathogenesis story. And there are other markers which come up in just one or two um, uh, patients, which would be great for stratifying them down the line. And I just highlight a few of these. As I said before, many of them are involved in cell migration and motility. We have a lot of addressings and integrins. Uh, these ones that are uh, pop up quite regularly in the literature, so I thought I'd, uh, I'd highlight them. Yeah. So, we believe we've got a robust, reliable technique for um, generating these immune profiles, these signatures, and the long-term aim, of course, but the medium-term aim now, really, is to um, apply this technique to patients who are treated with biological drugs and have known anti-drug antibody um, status. So um, it's bound to be a messy experiment because a lot's going to be going on in these patients, but if we can further validate this technique in, in patients with known ADA status, um, that would be the first step towards um, our eventual aim of um, applying this technique to a prospective cohort of patients, which we can then follow through um, their transition from conventional treatment onto a biological drug. So we're hoping um, in the next few months to get the ethical approvals to start that, and um, along with the, our collaborators in the, in the uh, Avaris Consortium, we get blood samples uh, before treatment, uh, during treatment, and uh, follow up a year later. We're really excited um, if we can hone these, these markers down from 332 to 20 or 30, then it might be useful as a clinical tool. If we can, if we can find any pr predictive markers, any early activation markers that will be useful. Um, unlike uh, gene array technology, every major hospital has a flow cytometer, and uh, we're hoping that if we can get this down to 20 or 30 markers, it'll be a quick diagnostic tool and it will help in the decision-making process leading up to um, uh, the decision as to which drug to use. And at the same time, it's too tempting to ignore some of these hits we've got uh, in terms of the pathogenesis of RA and also uh, for the better definition of regulatory B cells. So we're going to be following up some of the functional relevance uh, of these shortly. Uh, well, actually, those studies are underway. Our 
quick uh, list of thank yous. I'm very lucky to work uh, with Claudia Mowry and Liz Jury uh, at the UCL. They're my PhD supervisors. Jessica Manson is the consultant rheumatologist at UCH who's been uh, providing us with clinical expertise and uh, recruiting patients for us. David Eisenberg is the Centre Director of the Centre for Rheumatology, without which none of this would be possible. BJ uh, is the contact, is the MD at BioLegend, who's provided with, with many of the reagents that we've been using, and Jamie Evans is the manager of our flow cytometry facility. I uh, am required to ask you to visit avirisk.eu for more information on the avirisk <laughs> consortium and its aims, and if you've got any uh, longer questions or uh, comments, there's my email address. I'll be grateful to hear from you. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much. Um, have any questions? Actually, I have a few. Um, let's talk around. So, first of all, in terms of these differences that you've seen across um, patients, or do these persist in individuals if you look at them longitudinally? So, so it's, does the same guy have the same gene signature a month later? So, in terms of the RA patients, we haven't looked because we've used all of the blood sample in, in, one, in one shot. But we have followed them through, uh, followed the healthy controls through. And, I mean, they're, they're remarkably similar. So but no. Are, well, one might imagine the differences you see in disease are the ones you want to make sure don't change, yeah, right? Absolutely. Um, the second question, or I actually thought it's a, it's a remark. Um, one might want to exercise some caution uh, in calling immature cells, immature cells, all based on CD24 and, uh, especially, because that can go up and down based sure. on activation status. I mean, there's really no such thing as a 24 negative sure. cell. And so do you have any thoughts about whether when you see it high, I mean, I noticed that you saw that high in some of your patients, and call it an immature cell, call it, oh, sorry, you're dating that as an immature subset. Yeah. And then you're going and looking at markers that are defined as immature by that marker, is it is it conceivable that what you're seeing is activated cells that may well not be immature cells and you're just calling them that because they're 24 positive? Yes. So I, 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 I <coughs> was hoping to be more clear. I should really be calling them immature B cells and not regulatory B cells or anything like that. But even in terms of de defining immature B cells, it's, it's uh, pretty contentious. Um, so we uh, do a lot of work extending the panels now. We do, we, we're, we're We've got a postdoc working on it pretty much full time. Um, everything that we do, every hit that comes out of this panel, we then um, uh, apply a, a, a greater variety of markers to try and eliminate some of that ambiguity. So we, we, we look at IgM and IgT as well. You know, your differences are your differences, and they're probably mm. useful no matter what they mm. are. It just might be worth being careful what you call them so you don't mislead. Uh, the masses it's in terms of the belief about exactly where the cell arose. Sure. So. sure. So everything I've shown you has has been followed up with with a, a, a greater panel of antibodies, a larger panel of antibodies. Uh, um, so we yeah we do look at C twenty four, thirty eight, twenty seven, IgM, IgT, C ten, and all the others. Okay. Really nice talk in <coughs> Interesting. Thanks. I mean, the problem would be getting enough patients similar with you know similar responses. But yeah, but, but but until you can understand that, it may be actually difficult to differentiate between what's going on biologically with in terms of response of mm. the therapy versus what's happening in terms of an immune response to the therapy. So two different things that are both biologically important, but that you need to take out. Thank you. Yeah, I was 
I was going to, um, I, I guess Valerie maybe already said what I was about to say, which was, um, is the system going to be sensitive enough for you to actually look at antigen-specific responses? Because if you have this sea of responses to many autoantibodies, um, and the response to the drug might just be a small percentage of the B cells. So are you going to be able to look at that in some way? Yeah, so uh, one of the problems with the technique is that um, you need a lot of cells. And if you're, well, it's, when we hone down into the, just the immature B cells, what we call immature B cells, you know, uh, yeah, we're already looking at very small numbers of cells. So this really is a shotgun approach, looking at big differences in big cellular compartments, and um, it's really just uh, a tool to generate hypotheses, which then need to be you know, further uh, analysed with greater panels of antibodies and, and we and we then go down to the to the um, to the uh, the smaller smaller compartments, even down to a single cell level or you know a few few hundred cells uh, with, with mRNA technology. So yeah, I mean it's it's a bit of a shotgun approach, but it's um, it's where we're starting. Yeah, I, I was also impressed with your wonderful technology and a great talk. I um, I was also concerned about the sensitivity based on your lovely control data, how remarkably homogeneous as you mentioned. And I don't know if it might be possible to maybe gear your screen directly towards your hypothesis of RA, because mm -hmm. I believe I would think that this panel is being sold as a catch-all for any yeah. application. And I know in my personal experience using validated low cytometric methods that there's a Patient-to-patient you know, -patient difference for healthy volunteers is quite remarkable when you're just looking at a T-cell subset, for example. Um, so that might be something you might be able to catch more targets actually by optimizing the screening method itself. Great. Yeah. I mean, as I said, the, the resolution on those maps is quite is quite uh, poor because we're looking at whole PBMCs to start with, and yeah, it's a wide range of MFIs. We are discussing various options with Biologend and, and other companies, see if they can make us a custom kit. Yeah, that might, and I wouldn't think you'd need to even enrich your B-cells just using an optimized panel on whole PBMC cells either. Yeah. I mean, maybe not for antigen specific yeah. B-cells, but for at least for you know, certain surface lines. Mm -hmm. Another thing we're hoping uh, might be possible is to get these the subsets, antibodies that we're interested in, titrated down and put into the plates at the same time to make things a bit, a bit quicker. Also, possibly barcoding the patient so it can all be done you know, very quickly, which would be useful if it does become a clinical tool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.